turn to Matthew chapter 2. <clears throat> it is about the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, it's not Christmas, but it's always Christmas, technically speaking. And we're going to start from verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, the Magi, if you got the King James Version, it probably says wise men, from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who was born, has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. And all Jerusalem with him. Because, you know, Herod was a bad guy. And if Herod gets disturbed, ain't no telling what may happen. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, <clears throat> he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they replied, for is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judea, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it arose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming into the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, myrrh, and having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. And we want to briefly talk about the plans of God and the stubbornness of man. The plans of God and the stubbornness of man. Now, when I say man, you know what I'm talking about humans, right? We don't have to be politically correct, do we? <laughs> but... When we say the, 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 the plan of God, God has a plan. And God's plan has been established in eternity past. Before there was a when and a were, God had a plan. And that plan, I know you don't believe it, but that plan is working out just like he said it would. Even when the demons from the pit of hell are... Uh, in an uproar, when they're trying everything they can to stop you, hold fast to God's unchanging hand because he will never leave you, nor will he forsake you. Friends, family, oh, some of the ones who said, oh, well, we would be, we're going to be friends to the end. They'll leave you. Some of your blood relatives will leave you. See, this is what people don't understand about the gospel. The gospel can be very divisive. Not that it has to try to be divisive. You don't have to try to be divisive with the gospel. The gospel message itself is very divisive and it causes division because humans don't like to do what God says and that's going to always be a problem because God is never going to conform to human beings. Now when we see the miracle of the virgin birth and how Herod and the Jewish leaders Ignore the signs. This is what I always tell people. <clears throat> I, I, I believe that God can do any miracle today. I don't believe a lot of these people who's talking about they got a miracle from God. I don't believe it. Because if as many people who are claiming that they got miracles, they're not miracles anymore. By definition, a miracle is something that does not happen all the time. By definition. So the virgin birth, there would be one virgin birth. Because the only virgin birth in the history of the world is one. And so that this was a miracle. And they saw the signs. I'm going to show to you 
how you can show people signs. They can see signs and wonders. Preach the unadulterated gospel because it's the only thing that changes heart. Miracles does not change people's hearts. God can do miracles and he still does miracles, but it can't change anybody's heart. I'm almost disturbed when I see people and they say they're preaching a sermon and they preach a whole sermon and all they got is a bunch of people lining up talking about they're healing them and stuff, but they never preach the gospel. Notice that even when Jesus was doing healing, he always presented the gospel. Even when the apostles did healing, they presented the gospel. How are you going to save their soul? Even if you stop them from being crippled, blind, and everything else. If they're going to hell, what use is that? When we see the miracle of the virgin birth, I'm just, I'm bewildered on how Herod and the Jewish, especially the Jewish leaders, because they're supposed to have been religious. Now, it tells me God does not need anyone's permission to accomplish his will. That's what this story tells me. But it also screams how humans will ignore miracles and signs until God opens up their hearts and minds. Before we get to God's plan and man's black heart, I want to ask you a question. <clears throat> now, this is something that has been debated, and uh, people have different opinions on this. It's not something that will send you to hell, so I'm not proclaiming that, because there's a lot of good people on all sides who disagree on this here. I just happen to be right. No, just kidding. <laughs> it's, it's, it's something that will um, is worth discussing. Put it that way. My question is, when did the Magi or the wise men arrive to see the Lord Jesus Christ? Was it the same day that he was born? That sounds like an odd question. I don't know if you ever thought about that or not, but I'm going to show you something. Uh, it, it, it seems like a simple answer. Well, it was on the day he was born, but I disagree. I don't think there's no way that the wise men showed up the same day that he was born. And I'm going to show you. Some say they uh, they came when Jesus was first born, but that would not be true because in Luke chapter 2, now you got to go over to Luke chapter 2, that's why you got to read all the gospels. In Luke chapter 2, it says, she, talking about Mary, gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Now, I do believe the NIV is more accurate when it says no guest room. And the reason I believe this is because back in those days, everyone had an extra room to allow guests who was visiting from out of town to stay in. Some have suggested that Joseph's relative had a guest a room, but some guests was in their home when uh, Mary and Joseph showed up. And there was no holiday inns. Go look back then. There were no such thing as hotels back in that day. So when it says inn, it's talking about a guest room. There were no hotels and motels back in this day right here. Almost every home would uh, get a room or a guest room ready that in case somebody was passing through, <coughs> excuse me, they could actually stay overnight in the guest room. And so if there was no holiday inns, that may uh, be the reason that there was no room for Mary and Joseph. It seemed like somebody would have made room for the Messiah. Really? You know, you know what I mean? Like, I I'm here, but the Messiah is here. Let me, let me give him my room. So if, if there is no room with a, no one with an empty room, the only place for you to sleep is either outside or in the barn. Now, in our text in Matthew chapter 2, follow me for a minute. It says, on coming, the, the, the wise men, on coming to the house, they saw the child. See, Luke says they were in the barn. That's when the shepherds saw him. Uh, Matthew says they were in the house with the mother, with the mother Mary. And they bowed down and worshiped him. In Matthew, the wise men entered the house. But in Luke, it says the shepherds seen Jesus in the manger. So it was not the same day. I don't believe Jesus was born the same day the wise men arrived. They did follow the star now. 
This is God's plan too. Notice how God just draws people to himself. They didn't just say, you know what? Uh, we believe that it was going to be a Messiah, but God had to draw them to see the Messiah. Now, some have suggested that it was two years because Herod wanted all male children killed two and under. I don't agree with this particular viewpoint, but some people who are well thought out, that's what they say. Even if these, these people were traveling from the Persian Empire, they could crawl in their belly and get there before two years. So I'm not buying that one. Also, there are some who say it, it's the same day based on what Matthew says in verse 2, where it says, where is the one who was born king of the Jews? <clears throat> this is what the, the wise men are asking. But it says he was born, yet it does not suggest they arrived on the day he was born. They're just looking for him because he was born, and the star said, go this way. Now, we could argue that Joseph and Mary's offering suggests that the wise men did not become, not, not, not come and, and, and bear their gifts before they went and did their offering. This is my argument here. Now, follow me. In Luke chapter 2, it says, it took him, uh, they took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, Every firstborn male is to be consecrated unto the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what's said in the law of the Lord. A pair of doves are two young pigeons. A pair of doves are two young pigeons. Now, if you look at Leviticus uh, chapter 12, the purification process usually takes 40 days. You can look at it for yourself. That's your homework assignment. Leviticus chapter 12, Mary had to go through the, 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 uh, the purification process. Now, what most people don't ever say that much about Joseph, but uh, Joseph was a, uh, a godly man. The Bible said he was a godly man. That, that God picked Joseph. Every man couldn't have been Joseph because they, they wouldn't be able to cope with this. But Joseph was a godly man and he followed the law. And I do believe Mary and Joseph would have given, would have not given a pair of doves or two pigeons if the wise man had showed up with these gifts. Because it don't say how, how, how large a gift they gave. But if they're going to travel this far, I can guarantee you they dropped off some, some moolah. They dropped off some, 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 because you remember what it says, right? Now, technically, if you, if you have enough money, you're supposed to give a lamb. But if you're poor, you're supposed to have a pair of doves and two or two pigeons. One of the two. That's a poor sacrifice. So it could have been up to 40 days when the wise men showed up. Some will disagree with me, and I don't have no problem with that. I'm just saying I can't see Joseph and Mary not giving a lamb if the wise men had dropped off the gift that they were bearing. Don't tell me they just gave them a little gift. Now, they're going to need this gift that the wise men, this is how God works. They're going to need this gift to do some traveling because Joseph is not rich. Mary is not rich. God sends these wise men to bring gifts to the Messiah because Joseph, they're going to have to be on the run for a little while. They needed some money. So I'm arguing that it could have been up to 40 days. I'm not adamant about it. I mean, I could be wrong. But before the wise men showed up, when we read in chapter 2 of the book of Luke about the Lord Jesus Christ's birth, let's start at verse 1 to see God's perfect plan <clears throat> being worked out. Now it reads, in these days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census uh, should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Cornelius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee into Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David. Now, do you think that it's just by chance that Caesar issues a decree for a census. 
You just think that's by chance. You think God playing that. See, when you read the Bible, you got to see there's all kind of little detail, a little small. I mean, every little I is dotted. <coughs> Excuse me. Every T is crossed. Everything that he plays out works out to his perfect plan. So this wasn't some, you think it seems random, right? Because all of a sudden when Jesus is born, okay, we got the decree because we need to get you out of Bethlehem. <laughs> so God told Michael the prophet about the birth of the Messiah in the book after Michael's own name, chapter five. It says, but you Bethlehem Ephronet, though you are small among the clans of Judea, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. God planned it long before Caesar Augustus was even born. God had a plan. See, this is why I want you to stop getting frustrated when you look at the news or this other things. God is in charge. You just get right with God. Let everything else work itself. God got this under control. Our job is to get right with God. No matter what else happens, I want to be right with him. When it, Whatever kicks off, kicks off. I got to get right with him because no matter what else happens, if I'm right with him, he's going to take care of it, right? But this is just an example of God's perfect will being worked out. God uses people that do not even worship him in order to work out his perfect plan and will. You know the song, What a Mighty God We Serve? When you start looking at the, the intricate details of how God plans stuff, nobody can make a plan like God. He's the master chess player. Yeah, all his moves is made before the world was even created. He already have all the moves down packed. You know what moves you're going to make it, everything. You can't beat him. No matter how powerful somebody think they are, you cannot stop. The plan of God. I want to make that clear. Because Herod had to learn this also. It says, now when Herod, who was a wicked man, heard the wise men were looking for Jesus. First it says, he was disturbed. And all Jerusalem with him. Why was wicked Herod afraid? This is the one they call Herod the Great. He was a good builder too. He built the temple. He did a, But this is the same Herod. Who had killed one of his ten wives. He had ten wives kill one of them. So you trying to. I, I think you made a committed adultery. I don't got no proof. Let me kill you. He also killed three of his own sons. I will kill you. This, this is the Herod. Why would this Herod be concerned about a baby? He's a ruthless man. So why is he afraid of a baby? Most believe why Herod did build the temple in Jerusalem. It was a magnificent edifice too. Some still question his Jewishness. Yes, they did. They questioned it. So in other words, he may have a little chip on his shoulder because technically speaking, Herod was an Edomite. Now, you know what an Edomite is, right? Is a descendant of Esau. Esau have I hated. Jacob have I loved. See, this is not from the promise. <laughs> Not that God can't choose anybody from anywhere, but this may be a problem right here. <clears throat> because some other people are questioning maybe his Jewishness. Because since he is a descendant of Esau, not Jacob. So it's possible that every little thing threatens him, including a baby, especially a baby that is called the king of the Jews. What y'all get this name from? <laughs> Who told the wise men that the king of the Jews is being born? That's a good question. But you will notice something else in the text. It called together all. This is what they said Herod did. He called all the people's chief priests. Not his chief priests. He called all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law. And he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him Bethlehem in Judea. So, I got a question now. See, when you read the Bible, that's why you got to meditate on it sometimes. Sometimes you got to read your couple lines and just put it down and think about it. Now, what, what, what is God trying to tell me here? So my question is, 
why didn't the chief priests and the teachers of the law not follow the wise men to see the child? <clears throat> that's, a question, that's the first question I want to know. See, I got questions. I'm like a curious little child when it comes to asking questions. I got questions galore. Whenever somebody said they know everything, I'm glad I met you because I got a lot of questions I want to ask you. Since you're so smart, you're smarter than God. I got plenty of questions. I got them for days. I'm like a little toddler or something. Now, why and why this and why that? So why didn't the chief priests and the teachers of the law not follow the wise men? Since they say the scripture says he's to be born in Bethlehem, these fellas are traveling. And you know they're not traveling with like, everybody act like they just was like three little guys. Now they got an entourage. I don't know how many it was, but I can guarantee you weren't just no three people traveling. <sighs> Excuse me. But if they hear that the long-awaited Messiah has been born, why at least not go, at least to see? You can say, well, these, these people, these freaking Gentiles is a little crazy. We're going to just ignore the shepherds that already told them the same thing, and they're Jewish. You see what I'm talking about? When people want to ignore the facts. So God sent the Jewish shepherds to tell them first, and now these magis, these wise men, these Gentiles, traveling from who knows where. I, I'm guessing Persia somewhere. Why don't these scribes, teachers of the law, go out to investigate this thing? See, this is the problem with religious people. I, I personally don't like religious people. I don't. I got no problem with spiritual or spirit-filled people. I got no problem with Christians, but I hate religious people. Because personally, I think that they are some of the most dangerous people ever. If you ever studied church, church history, You'll see one of the biggest problems in the church was the church people. See, they're not filled with any kind of Holy Spirit. They're religious. Religion is not the same as being a uh, spirit filled. It's a different. There's all kind of religious pe people going to bust hell wide open. They have not taken. See, uh, it seems to me that they have they have taken the, the vaccine of religion. Now, you know what vaccination is supposed to be for, right? To prevent you from catching some. They've taken the vaccine of religion to make sure they never are born again. See, once you take the vaccine, it prevents you from actually catching. That's what vaccine is supposed to be. Now, pay no attention to what your media and your news station has been taking. Vaccine is supposed to prevent you from catching whatever they're trying to prevent you from catching. Problem with these religious fanatics the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin Council, Sadducees, and whole nine yards. Same problem with our churches today. They got big, 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 fine buildings. All they talk about is building their buildings. I got a new car. I got a new Lamborghini. The Lord is really blessing me. No, he's not. Mm -mm. Because all the time giving people money and stuff is not a blessing all the time. That could be your worst enemy. See, some of these people, they're too, they're too high and mighty to ever worship God. And I believe that these particular so-called leaders of the church, these religious folks, have taken the vaccine of religion. So they have there's no possibility that they're going to ever go see about this Messiah that has been born because they took the vaccine. Now, the only way I can explain people who go to church all the time but never change, that they have been inoculated. They have been inoculated against the truth of God and uh, God-centered worship. That's the only con con conclusion I can come up with. Because <clears throat> I don't know if you know anybody like this. Maybe you don't know nobody like this. And I'm not throwing no stone at anybody. But I don't know how you... See, this is like you said. You've been going to the gym for like, I don't know, 15 years. You didn't lose one pound. Matter of fact, you gained fat. You got more and more out of shape the more you went to the gym. People been going to church 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, and they ain't changed nothing about themselves. They're like little newborn babies. But they got all the fancy little sins. They know when to, when to say amen. They know, they know all the songs. You can't quote more Bible than the devil. The devil know more Bible than you. But see, we're having these religious activities. And this, this is what a true gospel needs to do. We need to start exposing these frauds. We really do. Because I want somebody to explain to me. We're going to get back to this. 
And see, I'm showing you that this is the problem of dirty hearts. Somebody needs to explain to me. I dare you to go look up how many churches is in your city. Go look up how many churches are in some of the worst neighborhoods. I'm going to keep saying it. <clears throat> because if nobody is repenting and nobody's heart is changing and the, and the country is becoming more and, more and corrupt, there's a problem. Do you know how when America first came great, everybody wanted to give all the credit to the founding fathers. There was, that was some of them that was uh, God-fearing, but not all of them. The real change in America came with the great awakening in those gospel preachers like Jonathan Edwards, uh, George Whitfield, those who came through preaching the gospel, changing people's hearts and minds. That's what made America great. You can talk all day long how great you think the Constitution is. Without God, nobody care about your Constitution. Just don't. What made America great is because the word of God was spreading and it was preaching that any country who ignores the word of God and are hostile towards the word of God, how can you expect that country to be great? I don't care what no politician tells you. I don't care what no so-called leader tells you. When you got people who are hostile towards the things of God, your leaders are hostile and you leave them in charge. Just like every other kingdom has failed, God would be a liar if he allowed wicked countries to keep doing the wickedness that we're doing, France is doing, America is doing it, uh, UK. You just go down the list, all of them. The West is so completely corrupt, and they're saying they're going to go over to some of these other Muslim countries and save people. You can't save nobody because you're lost. How are you going to save somebody when you're lost? But we have these leaders right here in this text. I want to know why they didn't go out to visit the Messiah that they said they were waiting on. That's my question. I could park it right there for like 15 minutes if you like me to. They have their organizations. They have their committees. They meet all the time too. They are respected in the church and their communities. But they do not know the God of the Bible, period. And the reason I can say this is because I, I, I played church for a long time, too. Time is too short to be playing church now. Playing with God will get you in hell. That's who these chief priests and teachers of the law really are. They're these people who have these, and they like everybody to see them doing some. If you're going to do some good, why everybody got to know about it? How about you do something and only God knows about it? Let him reward you. People are too anxious to do something and they won't, they don't want somebody else. Now, I let God give me my reward. I want God to give me my reward. I don't, you don't have to know what I did. I want, I want my reward from God Almighty. Then I'll testify about his goodness. Because let's not forget that this is not the first time these religious leaders have heard the Messiah has been born. What are they waiting for? I mean, what are they waiting for? The, the second coming? In Luke's gospel, it tells us about these shepherds. Let's go over to Luke. Who were out here in the field with their sheep. Isn't it funny how God is showing up with these Gentiles from another country and he showed up with the Jewish shepherds. It says an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the scripture says that the glory of the Lord shone all around them. This is the shepherds. Why would God want to go introduce uh, uh, the, uh, this Messiah through these shepherds? Mm -hmm. See, the other people, you're too busy. You're too big time. He, uh, I got these shepherds. They got time to do what I, they obedient. And it says the angel declared that he was bringing the shepherds good news. You just imagine you out there with your sheep and an angel just shows up. See, this is why I have a problem when I hear people talk about they saw an angel or they saw Jesus and they were just standing up acting normal. What? You did what? Hold on. Repeat that again. Run that by me again. Show me in the Bible when the angel shows up or when the Jesus shows up. You remember when Jesus was in heaven and Paul was on his way to Damascus? It says that the, the light was brighter than the noonday sun. <clears throat> Excuse me. How are you just going to be, well, we were just walking around having me and Jesus. Child, quit lying. Quit, don't lie like that. You need to repent right now of that lie. I will completely turn anybody off. And there's no shortage of them on YouTube and on all these gospel stations. Everybody talking about their revelation. I'm not interested in your revelation. I'm interested in the gospel. 
Don't tell me about your revelations. I don't care. I need to get some gospel because only the gospel of God saves souls. Show me anywhere in the Bible where it says your revelation saves souls. Paul says only by the preaching of the gospel. Not this watered down stuff. Not this patty cake, patty cake, trying to be nice with everybody. You're trying to stop them from going to hell. The angel's exact words was, do not be afraid. Notice when the angel shows up, it's got to tell people not to be afraid. If you see anybody saying they seen an angel or they seen the risen Lord Jesus Christ and they was walking around, turn them off and run away. Period. I don't care who it is. They're liars. You can tell them I said so too. Nobody sees God Almighty. Nobody sees the Lord Jesus Christ risen. Nobody sees an angel and then just walking around like no. You got your ego puffed up a little bit too much. The scripture says, the angel says, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born. To you, he is the Messiah. Hold on a minute. Hold on just one, one minute. I said the angel told the shepherd boys, the Messiah has been born. Did, does your Bible say that? Because we they gonna go to town and get this news up. And I don't understand why everybody's not out of here. Because my, my Bible says that the angel showed up, the angel showed up and said, don't get scared. I know you're afraid, but I got good news for you. The Messiah, the one who came to set the captives free, he has arrived. This will be a sign to you, he says. You will find the baby wrapped in clothing and lying in a manger. Now, I want you to watch this right here. Then it says, suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel. Wait a minute. Wait one minute. Now, what's going on here? Not only did the angel show up, a heavenly choir just shows up. Praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven. On earth, peace to those whom his favor rests. Now, does that get your attention? Now, if these shepherds, I don't know how many shepherds it was. Could have been eight. Should have, could have been ten. Could have been five. I don't know. Could have been fifteen. But I can tell you right now, if you see something like this, you ain't going to go to town and say, y'all ain't going to believe what I saw. Boy, it was, I was out there in the field, you know, me and the boys out there with the sheep and things and, uh, this angel showed up, and uh, we started chatting and stuff. Like, it was like, no, it's like, what's going on, Mr. Angel? What's your name? And uh, we gave, like, a dap, a fist bump or something. And then he told us, and, and, and matter of fact, let me, let me forget this. A lot of uh, other, like, heavenly hosts, like, I think it was the heavenly choir. They showed up, too, and they were singing. But it wasn't no big deal or something like that. I just came to give you guys a warning that uh, they told me that the Messiah is here. You think they went to town like that? Come on, now. That means these you, these leaders these leaders there saw this. They heard this because if somebody comes to town with this testimony, they're gonna be like those fellas on the road to Emmaus. They're not gonna come back. They're gonna come back saying our heart was on fire. <laughs> they're not gonna come back saying, you know what? I'm just gonna do. I'm gonna go home and take me a shower first, and then uh probably gonna fix me something to eat. Then I go tell the people. Uh uh, don't work like that. It does not work like that. That would get anyone's attention. The heavenly angels of God, the heavenly angel by himself, then the heavenly host appeared and to announce that the savior of the world has been born. I want you to show, see how filthy people's hearts is. All this time, the Sanhedrin Council been reading all these scriptures, studying the law of Moses, walking around, making up extra stuff that they, God ain't even proclaimed to them. All this foolishness is still going on today too. People making all these rituals this foolishness has nothing to do with the Spirit of God. You're not going to put me in bondage with all this legalist stuff you're talking about. Uh-uh. No, it ain't going to work for me. These angels show up and says that the Messiah is here. Why is it that not only is the, the Herod should have been out there, these holy rollers should have been the first one out there. The scribes, the Pharisees, Sanhedrin, walking around looking all holy. Jesus is not even welcome in most churches today. What are you talking about? They don't even want Jesus up in there. That, that's not the Jesus I know. He's kind of narrow-minded. Jesus is not welcome in these churches today. Got to be out your mind. 
But the angels did not make the announcement to the religious leaders, did he? Their heart is black. They, they've been inoculated with religion. <laughs> hey, angel ain't going talking to them. Isn't it a little suspicious that he didn't go to the religious, all these people who want to be such big shots? He didn't go over to the Jerusalem press and say, let me get this press clipping out that the Messiah has been born. God Almighty sent them to shepherds. I, I I like to park. I would like to park it down for like fifty minutes, really. I said, God Almighty sent them. He sent the angel and the heavenly host to some shepherds. Mm, mm, mm. Whoo! But after the heavenly host leaves, it says, "Listen to this." The shepherd says, "Let's go to Bethlehem." They didn't say wait. And see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. <laughs> he said the angels was just messengers. This is from the Lord. <laughs> and after they had seen it for themselves, it says they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. Wait a minute. You may want to read that in your Bible because maybe I may be reading out the wrong Bible. Or something. It says that. When the angel told them, these boys got on fire. And they went into town and started telling people. that They spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child, the Messiah. And all who heard it was amazed at what the shepherd said to them. Now, I'm still curious about something. Not only should it to me, should the, uh, the so-called religious leaders been there. Why is all these town people not there? I don't know how many people went over there to see it, but if I, you show up and said a Messiah is here, I'm going to go see that. If I'm in town, what? what? Uh-uh, wait a minute. I don't care. I'm in another state. I'm going to catch a flight. Because you just said, who just showed up? Mm-mm. I got to go see that. Uh-uh. Who just showed back up? The Messiah that we've been waiting on? Uh-uh. We got to get out there. Are you telling me that the chief priests and the teachers of the law did not hear the news that the shepherds were spreading. Are you telling me that? They were privy to all information. They heard everything. Every time Jesus would do something, they heard it. As we stated earlier, that we do not believe that the wise men showed up on that day that the Lord was born. So they had time. It ain't like the first day. I think they had time. <clears throat> Most people argue that it was anywhere from 12 to 40 days after the shepherds spread the word that the wise men showed up. Let's just go. Let's be real conservative. Say it was 12 days. Say I'm wrong with my 40 days. Say it was 12 days. So let me get this right. After 12 days, nobody goes out. To, you know what I say? They had been. This is Abraham's seed. This is the seed of David. This is the one they've been promising from way back. He came through 42 generations. You can read the lineage in Matthew chapter 1. 42 generations. And you mean to tell me you've been waiting 42 generations for the Messiah to show up and you will not go out and get a glimpse. So when the wise men showed up, they should have been saying, yeah, we already know about this. We'll take you to him right now because we already seen it. That's what they should have said. Now, I'm wondering, why is it that Herod didn't hear about this and go, did he just say he's a shepherd boy? They're probably crazy. They're probably seeing things. Because as everybody else heard, I'm just going, I'm, I'm just making a guess here. It seems to me when it got back to Herod then. But see, more dignitaries showed up now. Mm-hmm. See, some people will take people's word for they got a big church. They'll take their word for it, they like their CEO, their doctor, their lawyer. Mm-hmm. So we can take that word for it, but we, we can't take these little shepherds' word for it. That's what's wrong with our society. Sometimes we listen to the wrong people. How many doctors have been wrong? How many lawyers have been wrong? How many CEOs have been wrong? How many presidents have been wrong? How many senators and congressmen have been wrong? How many great big newspapers have been wrong? But they won't listen to shepherds. No, they won't. Nothing's changed, really. What's going on back then is the same thing that's happening in our day and time right now. Well, I got I got a plug in my uh, my computer. I'm going lower energy. Didn't plug it in. Now, what did these so-called leaders do with the message? 
absolutely nothing. God cannot trust everyone with his message. That's what this tells me. Look how many, look how many people right now can get the gospel. It's Bibles galore. You can get a Bible anywhere. Now you can get a free Bible now. You go to a hotel, Bible's in the desk. Nobody even never reads it. They got Bible on top of Bible. Back in the day, people were being tortured for printing the Bible. Now they got Bibles everywhere nobody's interested in. People gave their lives to print the Bible. People were threatened with death for printing the Bible in layman's terms so anybody can read it. And now everybody has this magnificent word of God and they won't even read it. They keep telling me you got problems. Well, I got the answers right here. I said you got problems. We got answers. Not me. Jesus is the answer. See, the Messiah who was born, he said he came to set the captives free. That's the one who just got born. It seems to me, people keep saying they want to make a change. Of, how, how many things you didn't try it already? Oh, did any of that work? It worked for a little while, huh? Okay, then. Now, I'm trying to introduce something that worked long term. This has been working since the beginning. God's word has always worked. But everybody want to try everything else. And then, after they try everything else, they say, well, I tried all this other stuff. I don't want to talk. Because I said, did you try this? I'm not... I'm not telling you about a product that I have not sampled myself. I'm not telling you about something that somebody else told me about. Because nothing I hate worse than somebody trying to sell me something. Whenever a salesman try to sell you something, ask them what kind of those things do they have. If it's a phone, what kind of phone do you have? Let me see your phone. They try to sell you a car, what kind of car? This is the best car ever. Everybody should get one of these. They try to sell you a dishwasher. Oh, this is the best dishwasher. Do you, well, you have one of these guys? This is the only dishwasher anybody should get. What kind of dishwasher do you have? Oh, I don't have this kind, but it's a good dishwasher. Oh, you ought to get this kind of refrigerator. I, I wouldn't do it. This is the only refrigerator I get. I don't drive nothing but a Ford. I don't drive nothing but a Chevrolet. This is the best cars ever. What kind of car you got? Oh, I don't have either one of those. I got a Chrysler. Don't try to sell somebody something that you're not using. Most of the world can spot a phony easily. Easily. They know who's real because the devil is in them. And they know who actually believes. So don't go perpetrating fraud if you don't really believe it. Start believing it. Pray that God opens up your heart. Time in prayer. Nothing beats time in prayer. If you pray more, I guarantee you, you'll read the Bible more. When you read the Bible more, you'll pray more. That's the key. It ain't complicated. It's not. Everybody makes it complicated because they want to see smart. They want to seem smart. Every person who was a great evangelist, every person who was a phenomenal Christmas Christian in God's eyesight, they had the two key things in common: a strong prayer life and a strong a uh, uh, word of God instilled in their heart. Period. No, they didn't use drugs. No, they didn't have to uh, be in a bunch of relationships. It's, it's, that's, that's the key right there. Everybody wants to make things difficult, but it ain't that difficult. It's not. You try all this other stuff, and then you come back, and then you want to, did you, did you try this? No, you didn't. This is not what somebody telling me. See, you can't depend on grandma did this, mama did. I don't care what they, I'm saying I sampled this for myself. I'm not telling you about a Jesus that I haven't tried. I'm not trying to get you to, to go to this Jesus and I don't know nothing about him. Uh -uh. I'm telling you, I didn't been through the fire with him. Or at least he was packing me through the fire. Many occasions. If I ever wrote a book on any occasion telling you everything he took me through and he did this and he did, I should have been done, but I did this and then he did this. And then I got hard hit and he beat me back in the last and get back on the track. Get back over here. Do this right here. There is no shortcuts to strong spiritual growth. There is no shortcuts. A strong prayer life, a strong a life of reading God's word and letting it sink in your heart. Not just reading it so you can quote it to somebody. That don't work for nothing. That ain't going to stop you when, you're, when you when you have trouble. No, you're going to gonna need to get a life jacket that when you're in trouble, you can just be in the deep water floating around. Because you got, I got my life jacket called Jesus. I got it on. It ain't nothing you're going to be able to do because I got my life jacket on. Oh, yeah, the water's deep. I'm getting water all in my nose and stuff, but I'm not going to drown. 
What did these so-called leaders do with this message? They didn't do nothing with the message because they've been inoculated. And that's what these churches is doing with the message today. Nobody can argue this point. Whenever I talk to somebody they want to get all spiritual with me, first thing I tell them is, yeah, let, me let, me let me see your church's community. If there's a bunch of crime in your church's community, they're not doing their job, period. That's all it is to it. Don't get mad at me. That's what the church is supposed to be doing, salt and light. Compromise, trying to be everybody's friend, trying to put all these programs to attract people in, is not going to win souls, period. That's all it is to it. Nobody wants to say this because they're like a big church. They like to stick their chest out. On judgment day, none of that matters. All that fluff, all that's going to get, that's like chafe. It's going to get blown away. Only what you do genuinely for the Lord Jesus Christ will last nothing else. You can try all this other stuff. You can try to dress it up all you want to. You can try to pretend all you want to. Only what you do out of a pure heart for Jesus Christ is going to last. Now, many people have Bibles. They can even tell you about the gospel message. They don't even really believe what's in there. I put a couple of names in the book when it comes out. I put a couple of names. You're going to be shocked. But what does most preachers and Christians do with the word of God? They take it. They distort God's word. They water down the gospel message and make it say things that is not saying. They are not really interested in making disciples unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, don't be talking about you baptizing Paul's name or, or Peter's name. You're baptizing Jesus' name. If, if the person is proclaiming the word of God and they're not pointing people to Jesus, it's a problem. Because you can fall any time, but Jesus don't fall. You need to point them to the master. That's what the gospel message is. But now Herod calls these religious leaders to ask, where would the Messiah be born? And they go to the scriptures. <clears throat> this is the thing that gets me. When he asked them about this, they immediately said, wait a minute, let's go to the scriptures. So they know the scriptures. This shows me the stubbornness of the human heart. It shows that Herod has a black heart, and it shows that the so-called religious leaders have a dirty heart too. Because when he says, where is he supposed to be born? He said, bam, right here. We got it right here, Michael. Fifth chapter right here. Bethlehem. They still ain't going though. What does that say about you? You know all these scriptures. The devil can quote scripture. Matter of fact, the devil knows just about all the scripture. He was quoting scripture to Jesus. Herod's response is to have the Messiah killed. That's Herod's response. See, dirty hearts, but God's got a plan. No devil in hell can stop God's plan. The Jewish leaders respond is to either they're jealous or their deadness of heart because they've been inoculated and they don't even go out to see it. Herod has no fear of God because if he did, there's no way he would be ordering these children to be killed. Who kills innocent children? Oh, I know we wouldn't do that in America because we're really progressive over here. Because if they love the law and the prophets like they said they did, why have they not went to see the promised Messiah? I say he was promised. Way back when Abraham took Isaac to sacrifice Isaac, he says, hold on a minute. I got one, because Isaac ain't going to do no good if you sacrifice Isaac, because he'll sin. Isaac was a sinner. <laughs> Let's not get that twisted. Isaac was the promised child, but the reason he was the promised child is because the lineage of Jesus comes through that. Not Isaac is righteous. Abraham was a sinner. Isaac was a sinner. Jacob was a sinner. David was a sinner. Noah was a sinner. All of them were sinners. Only through Jesus. This is why I don't understand why people trying to have this conversation. None of these people who come up they're so holy and I don't think my God would send nobody to hell. Are you kidding me? All these people needed Jesus. So you think you don't need Jesus. How arrogant of you. I got no problem with it. I know I need Jesus. <laughs> so I'm drowning out here. I don't think I really need you. No, give me Jesus. The leaders know that when the Messiah shows up, their gig is up because they got this phony religion going on. Phony religious folks do not want the real gospel being preached. Nowhere around them. Matter of fact, I don't know this story, but in England, George Whitfield, when he started preaching the gospel and saying people had to repent, all the churches put him out. That's why he started preaching to like 
homeless people. He started setting up in fields to preach the gospel because they said, you're causing division. We don't want you up in here no more. This is what the world does to the true gospel. Ain't nothing changed. Ain't nothing changed. See, it could be that they're kind of puffed up. And what they really are saying is that we don't really need the Messiah now because we're good enough now. Don't think they couldn't have that pride in their heart. The good news is God's plans never fail. You, everybody want to meme some? This is why no, no amount of news can get me worked up. Because my God is in charge, period. I don't care if they kill me, my God is in charge. Because if it ain't time for me to go, can't nobody touch me until it's time for me to go. Now, I believe that with all my heart. And when you get that man set in your mind, when you really get that in your mind, and you really believe it, you'll speak with boldness. It's just, it's just, it comes naturally. Because you cannot leave this earth. Do you, this God, unless you say God is in charge. If I thought God was in charge, I'd stop this. I, I don't need us doing no gospel message. That's ridiculous. If God is not in charge, let's just stop preaching. And if God is in charge, that means nothing can happen until God gives. You may not agree with all the ways he does stuff. I don't know why he does. I'm not going to even try to figure it all out. But I can tell you this. Nothing can happen unless God said. Look what they tried to do here. They got a wicked plan going here. <clears throat> I'm sure they say Herod called him to the side. These wise men say, yo, we're gonna, I'm going to go worship him too. It don't matter if people claim to be Christians. Because the, the church of Corinth probably had a lot of problems with them. They was claiming to be Christians too. God Almighty is in charge. God Almighty is in charge. And his plans never fail. Watch what Herod does next. It says Herod called the Magi, that's the wise man, he called him in secretly. And found out the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, Come tell me because I want to worship him too. Now this fool think that he's smarter than God. Now this is King Herod that will kill you in a minute. He killed his own kids, kill his wife. The scripture says after they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had been following, it rose and went ahead of them. Who's leading them? This is God's perfect plan. This is the perfect plan of God if you've ever seen. They got led from all the way from another country, and this star is leading them. And they're following it. You they say one day we just sit at home. You know what? It'd be a good day to go visit Bethlehem. Uh, let's go study up on that and see what we got going on. No, they had no clue. The star got their attention. God drew them in. God is the one who drew his sovereign plan. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed, it says. Herod, Herod thinks that uh, he can outsmart God Almighty. <laughs> There's a lot of people thinking they can outsmart God Almighty. It ain't never going to work for you, devil. He had a wicked plan to kill the child but God. That's all you need to know. That, that sums it up right there. His plan was to kill the Messiah. Now, if his plan is to kill the Messiah, who do you think Herod works for? He works for the devil. Let's stop making this thing difficult. Anybody who's not on God's side, they're on the devil's side. I don't care who it is. I'm going to say this until I die. Either you're on God's side or you're on the devil's side. When you side with God's enemies, you're on the devil's side, period. I don't care who it is. Herod thinks that he can outsmart God. There's a lot of people living today thinking they can outsmart God. God ain't impressed with your money because when you die, none of that ain't going with you anyway. None of your bling, none of your houses, none of your cars, none of that's going with you. I'm happy for you. Matter of fact, I want you to be prosperous. I want the people of God to be prosperous. I do. But don't let it get a hold of you. Then you start thinking that you're special, that you don't need God. The Lord Jesus was born for the sole purpose of saving humans from their sins. When you look at... At baby Jesus, just remember that in 33 years, they're going to kill him. The devil said, I, I want to take him out right now then. Forget this. Don't let him go to the cross and pay for people's sin. Live a perfect life and pay for people's sin. Let's kill him now. The cross of the Lord Jesus Christ 
was offensive to the religious leader. That's what it is. It's offensive to them. And it's offensive to the Roman Empire. The cross is offensive today to most churches. Oh, I know people carry these little crosses around their necks. And they're real spiritual. I love the cross. I don't believe that anyone should have a picture with the Lord Jesus on a cross on it. I don't. You can have it all you want to. I'm not saying you're going to hell for it. But I'm not putting Jesus on the cross. I don't want to see a picture of Jesus on the cross because he's not on the cross. Period. I got a problem with it. First, I think it's idolatry that people are worshiping these pictures with Jesus on a cross. First of all, you don't even know how Jesus look. Let's just be clear on that. This is why I don't believe in pictures of Jesus. You know why? Because nobody knows how Jesus look. Period. I'm not, I'm not going to argue with somebody on how Jesus look. Personally, I don't think we should have pictures of Jesus because we don't really know how he looks and only gives the enemy something to argue about. I've seen people be arguing about this back and forth. What's Jesus' skin color? I don't care what his skin color is. I really don't care. All I know is that I was dying and I was on my way to hell and he could be green. Matter of fact, uh, I don't care if uh, he got seven eyes and three heads. If he's the savior of the world, I, that's the Jesus I want. See, if you're, if you're, you're in a deep ocean and you're drowning, are you going to say, no, I only want a certain skin color person saving me because I'm out here drowning, drinking water in the deep ocean. Oh, ain't no other boat coming by. You about to drown. Well, that's okay because I got my principles. Who's stupid enough to say that? I got these, these fools are arguing about skin color. That's why the Bible don't even talk about skin color. I've never seen so much argument about skin color. I don't care. Right is right. Wrong is wrong. I don't care what your skin color is. Because they don't have no segregated sections in heaven. It's not going to be like that. It's saints. Period. All the elements are in hell. I don't want to sit by the This is my favorite seat. What is that? I want to sit by Paul today. <laughs> the Lord Jesus is the only one that can save us from the wrath that is to come. Period. We waste so much time. When I see somebody arguing about this, I'm not wasting my time with them. Because you're stupid. That, that's, a, that's a fact. I don't have time to be arguing about. If you're trying to save souls, you ain't got time to be arguing about this petty stuff. That's why I hate to see people going back and forth a little. What are any crazy about the show? But uh, according to this, shut up. Why don't you go and get, try to get some souls saved? And still talk about who's the Antichrist, who's not the Antichrist, and all this kind of stuff right here. We know for a fact without Jesus, you're going to hell. We know that for a fact. That's black and white. How many people have been wrong about the Antichrist? I don't care. Whenever he shows up, if he ain't already showed up. <laughs> Whenever he shows up, you're on Jesus' side, right? What difference does that make? We waste so much time on petty nonsense because we're not focused. We're not holding. See, Paul was holding in. On spreading the gospel. When Peter and, and John got focused. They was focused on winning souls. They had like tunnel vision. On winning souls. This one. Who was now being born. Is the only hope of mankind. Of being saved. Period. I'm going to say this again. I'm going to try to say it every week now. It's offensive for somebody to say. That there's another way to heaven. When they say that. If you still want to hang around them, because what they're saying to you is that, unless you just don't really care about that uh, bad mouth and Jesus, they're saying that Jesus is a fraud. They're saying that God is a cruel God, and he don't know what he's doing. Because if there's another way, why send Jesus? That doesn't even make, you going to let Jesus get tortured like this and there's another way? What sense do that even make? It's offensive. It's offensive for me. Just say you don't believe what the Bible says. That's fine, but don't say the Bible doesn't say that Jesus is the only way. You can believe whatever you want to believe. I don't care. But don't you tell me that the Bible does not teach that Jesus is the only way. There ain't two ways. There ain't three ways. Jesus is the only way. He's the only one who can save you for your sins, period. No other religion. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's Hindu. I don't care if it's Buddhist. I don't care if it's Muslim. I don't care if it's uh, Jehovah Witness because they don't even believe in the real Jesus. Mormons, just go down the line. I don't care. Anybody teaching that you're not saved 
by the grace of God, through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, they're not preaching this gospel. And that gospel can't save you. See, that's the dirty little secret nobody wants to tell you. That gospel cannot save you. They belong to the kingdom of darkness. The devil in hell knew that the Lord Jesus was the Messiah. The devil, ain't, the devil knows this is the Messiah. What are you talking about? From the time that my Lord and Savior was born, he was destined to die. Voluntarily destined to die because it's God's plan. Everybody think they got a plan working it out. Think you can, you, you can stop God's plan. You ain't stopping God's plan, fool. You can't stop God's plan. The devil at first attempted to prevent him from going to the cross. First he tried to kill him as a baby. Then he offered the Savior, Jesus King. He said, you can have all these kingdoms if you just bow down and worship me. Because if the Lord Jesus does not go to the cross, then we are all doomed. See, the gospel message that we preach is foolishness to the world. That's what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I said, when you talk about somebody, you tell somebody about the gospel message, they say, that sounds like foolishness. You mean to tell me if I believe in Jesus, I can go to heaven? What, what kind of stuff is that? That sounds kind of narrow-minded. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying that a holy God requires 100% perfection. That's, what I'm, that's not what I'm saying. That's what the gospel says. I'm repeating what my master says. Only the lamb without spot or wrinkle can get you into heaven. Are you sinless? Are you sinless? So you can't make up a new requirement. You can say you don't like this requirement, but that's what the Bible teaches. You say, I don't like the Bible. That's fine. I got no problem with that. I'm just saying, if anybody else is saying the Bible is not teaching that, they are a liar. And the truth is not in them. The Bible teaches the reason that Jesus is the only way because he's the only perfect one who's ever walked this earth. No angel could have saved you. Michael the archangel couldn't have saved you because Jehovah's Witness think he's an angel. Angel can't save you. God incarnate is the only thing that can save you because the law requires 100% perfection. And why is it foolishness to the world? You may ask. Because the gospel message declares that it is only through the imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ that will save you. Seems to me, every, everybody always likes free stuff. <laughs> but why do they want to argue over this free stuff? You ever notice that? Filthy heart people? Because they've been inoculated. Some have been inoculated. Some of them just so sold out for the devil. If you want to see an industry that is full of devil worship, just look at the mu music industry and the movie industry. I'm not saying they're the only ones, but it's just downright the money. I mean, it's downright the money. When you see some of these videos of these, and these kids are following their parents, and I'm like, look at this devil. This is devil worshiping. This is a devil. Have you seen this? The gospel declares that we all have an appointment with hell's fire unless we repent and accept Jesus Christ is Lord and said, seems kind of simple to me. I don't understand why people like to argue about this. They just say, it seems now, oh, because you want to do your own thing. That's fine. You, you, got, you got options. I'm not mad at you. I'm a, I was trying to help you out, but if you don't want to help, I'm not offended. You can't offend me by saying, I don't want Jesus. I hate that Jesus. That's fine. One day you're going to have to bow that knee, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one day. One day you're going to have to bow that knee. I don't care if you like it or not. You're going to bow. I don't care how bad you is, how powerful you think you are. Everybody's going to bow. Lucifer bowing. Don't say you accept him as savior if you don't want him to be Lord. Because he is a, is a package deal. He's not going to be savior unless he's Lord. Jesus Christ, the son of God, was born in a manger in Bethlehem because it was God's plan. Nobody else planned this. Nobody can plan this gospel. Nobody makes up a gospel like this but God. Herod could attempt to stop the plan of God, but no king, president, prime minister, CEO, billionaire can stop God's plan. Not ever. Not today. Not ever. You hear me? As long as I'm on God's side, no devil from hell can stop you. Period. The very gates of hell cannot stop God Almighty's plan. I believe that's what he declared, the very gates of hell. Now, what those who are proclaiming the gospel should do 
is remember that this gospel message is God's message to a dying world. <clears throat> They're dead. The Bible says we're dead in trespasses and sin. That's why it says you're saved by grace. So did the wise men come on their own or did God draw? Was the shepherds out there saying we just wait for the Messiah to show up or was God showed up? You better pray that God opens up your heart or your family members are. Ain't no kind of preacher. I don't care what kind of preacher you are. Not the Apostle Paul. Not Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Not George Whitfield. Not Peter. Nobody can preach somebody into the kingdom of God. You better ask the Holy Spirit to go in and change their heart first. You could be a beat your head up against every kind of wall. You have the door of the church being open for 30 minutes. That don't work. Let God do his work. Let God do the hard work. He's the one do the work. You can't change nobody. How articulate you are. Don't attempt to spray perfume on the cross. Stop it. All this spraying perfume on the cross. Don't add makeup to hide all the ugliness of the cross. The cross is ugly. If you're going to put Jesus on the cross, put the real Jesus on the cross then. Bloody, you can't even recognize him. Got him on there with a little blood running down. That's Jesus on the cross. I don't know who that is, but it ain't Jesus. Once you attempt to water down the gospel message, then it becomes a stumbling block for you also. Watering down the gospel will make it be a stumbling block to you. There is no different gospel. I once started was, I mean, try, you, you can't sugarcoat it. This is what it is. Because when people get mad at you, say, you know what? You're not really mad at me because it's not my gospel. This, this is what Jesus taught. I don't see it that way. Well, what, what part you don't see that way? When it says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes. It's the most quoted verse in the Bible. And whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. What does that mean? Just, I want you to tell me, give me the definition. Give me your meaning of that text. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. So technically, we need to do some, it's a grammatical error, error on this scripture, because it, it should say, God so loved the world that if you felt like it, Mm. There's some other ways, but if you really feel like it, you can come this way too. That ain't what the text says. It's not my gospel. I used to get offended if somebody said, I'm offended, but you ain't offended with me. I, I, I ain't your problem. Go talk to Jesus about that. Ain't my gospel. I didn't write this Bible. I'm talking about this came long before I was born. Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, For since the, in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. You hear that? For since the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of the gospel, uh, what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Did you hear that? The gospel message is a stumbling block to many Jews and it's pure foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, you hear that again? Rewind, match, play. And to those whom God has called, he picked up the phone and said, yeah, mm -hmm, I'm calling you. He got your number. Both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. There ain't no way to get to heaven but through this gospel message. And the gospel message is you are a sinner, you need a savior. Period. The leaders of that day have the same problems as the leaders of our day. God sends his word and it's proclaimed, yet they reject it because they've been inoculated. It took the vaccine. Some of them took the vaccine of pride. And the reason they reject is because they live in darkness. You got to turn on the light, but you can't turn it on. Holy Spirit's got to turn the light on in their hearts. And we all know that darkness really, 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 really hates light. I always, I, if you want to challenge somebody, say, you don't, you don't think darkness hates light? See, it's a metaphor, but it's true. Because your whole house can be dark. You can light one candle and then you can see light. It just darkness just takes off. Like, well, I need to go. I need to get out of here because light just showed up. Jesus shows up 
And this darkness just gets uncomfortable. Like, oh, we got to kill him. There's too much light. And I can't, I can't do my darkness. Oh, that light is blinding me. They're like vampires. God is wiser than all humans combined. Yet you can present the gospel all day long. Yet if the Holy Spirit does not convict their hearts, they will never believe. Period. Do you remember what the Lord Jesus told Nicodemus? Verily, truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Twice born. Twice. So when you present the gospel to someone, you must pray that God's Holy Spirit will open up their hearts and their minds. You say, I don't see why they can't see it. Don't get frustrated. No, because it ain't even your job, really. Your job is just to do what the master said. He said, you say, here it is. I want to present it to you in the nicest, loving way I possibly can. Now, if they want to be a cynic, don't waste your time. But if they're interested, really interested, this is what the gospel message is. The reason we need Jesus is because God hates sin. If it's, let me just sum it up. If you want to just, uh, you don't want to have to go into a long message and you say, I don't really know how to present it. It's very simple. God is holy. He's always holy. He will always be holy. He hates one sin. One lie, God hates it. One lie can get you in the hell. And you say, and you say to them, if it was left up to me, I kind of like you. I probably would let you in. But it's not me. This God I serve, he's really, 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 really holy. He's so holy that if you go over to Isaiah chapter 6, the angels won't even look at him. They got six wings. They're flying around with the feet covered. Flying around with the eyes covered, and they just singing all day long. Holy, holy, is the Lord of hosts. I mean, thunder and lightning. You saw what happened when he showed up with Moses on the mountain. Everybody got scared. He holy. He hates sin. He's not giving you these laws because he's a holy God. He hates sin. Now, in order for you to get there, but the good news is none of us are good enough. I'm not good enough, and you're not good enough. I like you, but you're not good enough to get to heaven. What my God has done now, you can pray that he do the same thing for you. He opened up my heart so I can see. So you want to pray right now that we can get the Holy Spirit to come in and take that, that dead black heart out. He does a, a open heart surgery on you right here. He can do it right here. I don't know how he do it. I can't even see. The wind blows, but I don't know where it's coming from. Bam, he goes in and he does a heart surgery without even opening it up. I don't, he is a magnificent. He's a great surgeon, by the way. Now, if you want that, I, I can... I, I, through my Savior, I can offer it to you. <laughs> I'm offering no money. No, we don't need your money. Mm -mm. This is free. Salvation is free. Mm. It wasn't free to Jesus, but it's free to us. Now you got to get to work because he gave you some eternal life. I was talking to my, uh, my sons the other day, and I told them, can you phantom how long eternity really is? I want you just to phantom that. Because I cannot phantom that. Thousand years, forget thousand years, forget 20,000 years. All the people talking about billions of billions of years of the earth exploded. You're going to get billions of years to be talking about that too. <laughs> to yourself, by the way, because we don't know exactly what kind of torment that be. You should want any of your loved ones to go to a place that is so torturous. I don't even, I, it's hard to even think about it. Because you got to think about some of your loved ones who you know were the same who died. It's heartbreaking. But when we get back to our story in Matthew chapter 2, Herod tells the wise man to go and find this king of the Jews, then come tell me so I can kill him. I mean, I can worship him. <laughs> he was he thinks he's smart. He think, this man thinks he can actually fool God. I just find it fascinating when these evil people think they got a plan that's smarter than God. You ain't fooling God. The text says, on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. They opened up their treasures. Did you get that? They opened up their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold. I don't know how much gold they gave him. They gave him frankincense and myrrh. I can guarantee you they didn't travel this far just to give him, like, I'm going to give you about 100. <laughs> I don't know what they gave him. I'm not going to speculate. But God had a plan that Joseph and Mary may need some money to survive until Herod is dead. Whoo, that God boy, I'll tell you, boy, he just, 
it, it just it just blows my mind. Every time I read, I'm seeing like, boy, I just this this, this don't even make any sense. Somebody doing a master plan like this. You talking about planning out a schedule? <laughs> he planned out the schedule. That's why Paul says, and in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, over there in Galatians, in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son. Eight years, the Messiah has been born, and they came in. They said, "Here your gift. We got your gold. We got you some Francine, uh, 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 some myrrh." Uh, frankincense, we got the whole nine yards. There you go. Now, I'm not sure how many people were with the wise man, but if they're traveling that far and they got, I'm sure they, they probably rich. I don't think they was traveling like light <clears throat> because they got to travel with enough food, change of clothing, the horses and stuff. They, they traveling like a posse. I don't know how they traveling, but it's obvious they got, got horses and carriages and stuff because they probably sleep in their carriages or stuff. I don't know. But I can guarantee you. Because when they came to town, everybody knew about it. If three or four people just come to town, everybody don't know about that. They roll up in town like they roll up in that deep. <laughs> like a posse. I'm sure it was a posse I'm rolling in. And so they presented the gifts. Would you like to know what they gave him, how much they gave him? I don't know what they gave him. I'm not going to even speculate. But I'm sure that these wise men now are feeling a little bit more joy because they have came and found what they was looking for. I don't know if they got saved after that. I don't know. If they, they probably went back to their town and told somebody, we followed this star and this Messiah, King of the Jews, has been born over here. I'm sure the word probably got back over there because when Jesus started doing his ministry, part of some of the same people said, we heard something about this about 33 years ago. About 30 years ago, we heard some about this. 31 years ago, we heard some about this. <clears throat> some wise wise men from our land came back and told us about this dude. <laughs> now, don't forget that these wise men are Gentiles coming to see the king of the Jews. But this is not an endorsement of astrology. I mean, see, astrology is good. This is a testament to the sovereign plan of God. He called them to come see the one who is born. He's born the king. He's born king of kings, lord of lords. God is drawing the Gentiles to the Lord Jesus before, right after he was born. He, he already drawn them in. The Jewish shepherds had already testified that the Messiah had been born. And now these wise Gentiles who came maybe from Persia are here to proclaim the message God has revealed to them also. So it is. it was God who sent the heavenly host with an angel to proclaim to the Jewish shepherd boys that the Messiah has arrived. Now these Gentiles from another country is proclaiming the same thing. Notice that King Herod has no clue when the Messiah would come. The so-called Jewish leaders seem to know what the scriptures say when he would be born and where he would be born. But the reason they uh, look this up was because the shepherds and the wise men are proclaiming this. Shouldn't they already know this since they're such spiritual leaders? You have this same issue today. So-called leaders of this church, of the church. They got all these dominating. They're arguing about all kinds of foolishness. <clears throat> i never seen so many gospel messages now because I listen to gospel messages all the time. And I go listen to them, and sometimes I just get turned off. Because here I'm trying to listen to you preach the gospel, and y'all going back and forth. They have people coming in and having debates and all this, and I don't have no problem with that if you preach the gospel most of the time. But I listen, I try to listen to some of these preachers, and, and I don't even hear the gospel message. All I hear is them telling you how smart they are, somebody getting a blessing, or they want to tell you that their denomination is better than this denomination. They're not really preaching the gospel. Because they don't really know the true God because they, in their mind, uh, they're more spiritual than you. They would know Jesus if he walked through the door and raised 20 people from the dead. They still would know. I don't know if that's really Jesus or not. Well, he got all the more because these people have been dead for like five or six days. And he raised 20 of them. But I don't really know if that's Jesus. I don't know if we should welcome him in our church because he's kind of stu uh, stuck up. He's trying to get us to change our traditions. We don't know if we want that Jesus in our church. The, the political leaders are only concerned with power. 
So they are blinded by pure corruption. That's your leaders and leaders of every country. Blinded by pure corruption. See, the church has a problem. The church is really the main problem. Because the church is supposed to be salt and light. Not, the, not these so-called fake leaders. If the church was doing what it was, what it's supposed to do, the leaders would do what they're supposed to do. You get the kind of leaders that you deserve. I, I, I believe that. You getting the kind of leaders you really deserve. If the people of God really went back to God and proclaimed God's word and stop worrying about who they're going to offend, we could change everything. But everybody's too. Uh, you, you you're not you're not you're not concerned about offending God. God's offended. I'd rather not offend God and offend somebody else. I'd rather offend the whole world than offend God because he's the one who got heaven and hell for me. The religious leaders of our day are too busy building buildings and having programs. The religious leaders, I, I, and there's nothing wrong with building a better building. I don't got a problem with that because if your church is really growing, and I mean really growing to my, with real Christian spirit-filled Christians, don't just begin the big building and just fill it with a bunch of people who don't even know Jesus. Have you paid attention to so many people in church? They don't be doing, they be playing on their phone and everything else. The gospel message being, not looking at the sermon on their phone. Personally, I think you should take an open Bible. I don't like, I don't want to read the Bible. I don't know wrong with if you have no choice right now but to read it online. But I like to get my Bible because I want to mark in there. I want to do some marking. I want to go, that way you can go out and just sit down and just read it. <clears throat> These people in church, and they're texting him and they're flirting and doing all this other kind of foolishness. They ain't even thinking about Jesus. You know, you go to some churches and you don't know if you had a pep rally or you had a church. There's too much playing going in church. You should be happy to be in the Lord's house. I don't got a problem with that. But I think it's too much uh, other activities going on. It's not Christ-centered enough for me. It's great to have children programs because you want to get the children involved with children program. It's good to have programs. But let it be biblical. A uh, 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 center where the kids are learning about Jesus. No, not playing a bunch of dumb games that's got nothing to do with Jesus. Let that little game they play be about Jesus. You go to prayer meeting, it be, should be some prayer going on. I mean, fervent prayer. And getting on your knees, fervent prayer. That's what's going to change them. That's why James said the fervent prayer of the righteous availed much. No, do you really be praying or you just say, you know what? Uh, well, I asked the Lord, well, Lord, bless me with this. What do you want me to bless you with? Oh, I just asked him to bless me with whatever. You say, I want to get better at doing this. Well, did you ask him? I mean, did you plead with him? Lord, please help me. Please, Lord. Beg like you want to when you want a new car or a new house or a new outfit. Beg like that. Don't come up here saying, well, I asked him one time uh, to make me stronger, but he didn't make me stronger. Are you doing the same thing you were doing? Before you actually make your strong, he's trying to show you gotta you gotta start trimming off some of that fat in your mind. You gotta start trimming it off. Like you get one of those big old briskets, you gotta start cutting a little of that fat off there. I like a little marble. I like a little marble. <laughs> when it comes to this, you gotta start cutting that marble off. Mm -mm, you gotta say, I gotta cut this fat off. You gotta say, because if I do this, it's gonna trip me up over here. If I do this, it's gonna trip me up over here. You gotta be quit having so much confidence in your flesh. And that's our problem sometimes. We think we can go any places. We think we can watch anything. We think we can do anything. And your heart is not going to be corrupted. The world will corrupt your heart. The devil knows all your flaws. He just studied you. He got one of his demons on you all the time. And they study to see your weaknesses. And see, when you start doing things that 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 is contrary to God, he just waits for it. He said, I know what you like now. I know what she likes. I know what he like. I know how to trip him up. I know how to trip her up. Whatever your weakness is, whatever your besetting sin is, the devil knows it, and he's going to use that. He'll wait till you get mad or weak in some kind of way, and then he's like, bam, now do this. I don't blame you. I won't even serve God. He ain't no good anyway. But it happened because you got yourself tripped up. And we get ourselves tripped up, and then we want to go try to blame God. Well, I tried, but I wasn't strong enough. No, no, you didn't try. What you did is that, first of all, you didn't allow the Holy Spirit to come in. Because the Holy Spirit will start knocking them. No, we don't need that no more. Nope, we don't need that. Uh-uh, we don't need that. Get rid of that one. No, uh-uh. That friend is not a good friend. You're going to stumble if you keep doing this. You know why you keep falling with the same sin all the time? Because you keep doing the same dumb stuff all the time. It's very simple. Why are we trying to make stuff complicated? 
The reason people are struggling is because they keep doing the same dumb stuff over and over again. Period. That's what they used to call uh, stupidity, right? <laughs> doing the same thing over and over again. And you start doing this, you'll be surprised. When you start trying to get closer to God, you pray more. The, the number one tool in any Christian life, the number two tool, this is like a tool belt. The number, the best two tools you're going to have in your tool belt, period, is prayer and the word of God, period. Then throw worship in there. But prayer and the word of God, those two right there is like your gunslingers. You pull them out, prayer, boom. Then you pull the other one out, you say, boom, I got the word of God right here. I will slice you up. Get off me, devil. But God has a way of working out his plan despite when we have great so-called opposition. Because <clears throat> anything sometimes is worth having is worth working for, right? Everything that will come easy. Now, I want to read. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna, I know I've been long-winded here, but I'm, I'm sorry about this. Now, I want to read uh, what the scripture says about those who come against the God of heaven. Now, it may sound a little long, but I'm going to read the whole thing. I want to read the whole thing. This is Psalm chapter 2. Now, listen, these, these are the, 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 the wicked people like Herod, the, the, the so-called uh, the, 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 the Pharisees, you know, the, the Roman Empire, your government, every government out there. Whenever they think they're coming against God, God's plans cannot be stopped. This is what Psalm 2 is saying. <clears throat> it says, why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine vain things. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Who is his anointed? The Messiah. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cards from us. Now, you, I want you to notice that the only name they really want to kick out of schools is Jesus. You can put here almost any other name in there. So if you say Allah or another God, just get generalize it. They don't want that Jesus name in it because it's against his anointing because that's the name that saves. Verse 4 says, and he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. <laughs> God is set up in heaven saying, look at these fools. They think they stopped. My plan is already secure. It's done. It's a done deal. It says, God sits in heaven and laughs at the world's plans trying to stop God's plan. It says the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king, who is his king, upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. He says, I'll give you the heathen for inheritance. And the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O oh, you kings, be instructed, ye kings of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry. And ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. And who is the him? In Jesus. It is a folly for the world leaders and so-called religious leaders to think that they can come against a holy God of the Bible. God's plan is concrete. It's set. It ain't no way, no devil from hell, no powerful leader, no billionaire. You could be a trillionaire because you're going to die one day. I don't care how much good help you think you got. You leaving this earth one day. Everybody has an expiration that they on them, period. In our text, the scripture says that the wise men had been warned in a dream. What? What you say? Lucky wise men. They was warned. Joseph and Mary just got lucky. It says that the wise men 
had been warned in a dream not to go back to tell Herod nothing. You get nothing, Herod. Now, who warned him in the dream? <clears throat> I'm just wondering. God's plans cannot be stopped by any so-called movement. God's plan cannot be stopped by any revolution. God's plan cannot be stopped by any world leader, any one world government, any church denomination, any devil from hell, period. Now, how you like that? You can't change God's plan. You can't stop God's plan. I don't care how black your heart is. God is in control. The text says that after the wise man left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph. You know that Joseph is getting a lot of appearance from the angel too. Nobody really talks about that. In this little short thing we know about Joseph, I mean the angel literally appeared to him like three times. I mean, besides Jake, uh, um, Daniel in the Old Testament and Joseph in the Old Testament, I don't see an angel which is appearing to nobody as much as Joseph. And Joseph don't even get talked about. It says that the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child and kill him. Whoo! By the way, Joseph and Mary going to Egypt was fulfill the fulfillment of another prophecy in the Old Testament. Boy, that God, I tell you something else. Whoo, boy, he just, he showed me just showing out a lot. He just showed you how my plan could get worked out. Just so happened in the book of Hosea, chapter 11, that it says, out of Egypt, I call my son. Just so happened, they went to Egypt. Oh, I think it was an accident. It's the plan of God. He told Hosea about it. Uh, Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. He says it over there. So all of this stuff, Herod, uh, the uh, uh, Caesar Augustus, all this stuff they think got going on, they think they they, they, they messing up God's plan. God had already said, y'all going to go to Egypt in the book of Hosea. What are you talking about? His plan was already worked out. Herod thinks he's doing something smart. This is God's plan. <laughs> I mean, isn't that funny? People be trying to do stuff. God already got this plan. Whatever move you make, he already encountered that move. Checkmate. Checkmate. Every move you make, checkmate. 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 He checkmating you at every move, and you're thinking you smarter than God. <sighs> See, our problem in our country today, in all these other countries, and all around the world, is not that God is not in control. It's that the people who call themselves Christians, they don't believe that God is sovereign because they're too busy conforming to the world. How are you going to read all this and just say this is by accident that he lucked up? All oh, this was lucky. Michael said he's going to be born in, 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 in Bethlehem. Now we got through Hosea in there. Herod thought he had a plan. He doing so smart. Oh, they're on their way to Egypt anyway, Herod. <laughs> what you tell me? I, already, I got with the wise men. I instructed them what to do. Got with Joseph, instructing my plan. It's working out just like I said. So yet again, it proves God's perfect plan. Then the scripture says that an angel told Joseph in a dream that Herod is dead. What you say? Here he is, another dream to Joseph. He says Herod is dead. You mean the fellow who thought he was going to kill the Messiah? He's dead? How's that working out for you now? Can I interview Herod right now? How'd that plan work out for you, Herod? <clears throat> are, you, are you pleased with how you was when you was on earth now? I guarantee you, if you talk to Herod right now, I guarantee you, Herod, Herod would not be saying, I, I, I had a beautiful plan, and I'm glad I, I did my plan. I guarantee you he wouldn't say that. What is so telling about the birth of the Lord Jesus is how the religious leaders ignored all the signs. That's the one I can't get over. This is as obvious as the handwriting on the wall. You remember the handwriting on the wall, don't you? But black hearts will ignore handwriting on the wall. Literally. In Daniel chapter 5. We're almost done. In Daniel chapter 5. There's a king by the name of Belshazzar. You, you familiar with the handwriting on the wall, aren't you? They didn't wrote books about it too. He got too big for his britches, as the old folk would say. 
you're getting a little bit too big for your britches. Not pants, it's britches. And so he got too big for his britches, and uh, God had to put him in line again because it's God's plan. <clears throat> now his predecessor, who is called his father in the text in, uh, in uh, Daniel chapter 5, uh, but he's technically uh, a descendant of Nebuchadnezzar. God Almighty made Nebuchadnezzar, you may remember when he got the big head, God made him lose his mind. Is it possible? <clears throat> when leaders lose their mind, is it possible that God Almighty makes them lose their mind? Come on, somebody. Mm -hmm. Knock, knock. Amen, lights and wall. I say, is it possible? When leaders start losing their mind, who's done wicked all their lives, is it possible? Huh. God may send you some handwriting on the wall here. But Mr. Belshazzar, the king, has this great big banquet. He's, a, he's balling now. He decides it would be a good idea to bring in the gold and silver goblets from the temple that was taken by Nebuchadnezzar. Now, I don't even know if Nebuchadnezzar ever tried this before. Because maybe Nebuchadnezzar said, I'm not going to even go there. But Mr. Belshazzar said, bring them in. He had all his nobles there. He, I got all my nobles letting y'all know what kind of what, who I am. He had his wives in there. And I said wives, plural. He had his concubines up in there. He, this party is like the bum, boy. This is like one of them Hollywood parties. This, this, they had him in there. He was drinking. There was wine everywhere. He said, wait a minute. We ain't drinking out of, these are not expensive. That's disrespect to God of heaven. What we going to do? Yeah, I'm going to disrespect the God of heaven. Now go, go in there and get them, uh, them, 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 them gold things out of their little temple. That little God they worship. Bring them in here. All of a sudden, he bring the temp he bring these 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 uh holy vessels that was in the temple of God in there, and he starts drinking from them. But then something happens. I say it something happens. Uh it, this will get your attention right here. It says that uh, a hand, I don't know about you, but if I see if I'm just sitting in a room with a bunch of people and a hand just started writing on the wall, I'm getting up out of there. I don't know about you. I'm not calling nobody. I'm getting up out of there because it's some it's some strange stuff come happening up in here. And it didn't happen until I drank out of these cups right here. So that's a problem. It says that the king watched the hand as it wrote. I get chills just thinking about that, man. Whoo! Nobody. I say a hand. <clears throat> I don't know what color the hand was, <laughs> but it's a hand with nobody. No arms, just a hand writing on the wall. It says the king watched the hand. His face turned pale, you think? And he was so frightened, it says, that his legs became weak. And his knees started knocking together. Mm -hmm. God said, I get your attention, Mr. Big Bad King. I will get your attention. I said he will humble you. It then says the king needed to know what the handwriting was. <laughs> he said, I need to figure this thing out because uh, I'm scared. <laughs> I'm scared about this thing. So he summoned, listen what he summoned, his enchanters, his astrologers, his divers. Then he said to the wise men of Babylon, whosoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have gold chains placed around his neck, and he will be made third highest as the ruler in this kingdom. You don't have it going on. Just tell me what my dream is. Well, guess what? These phony prophets, these phony preachers, these phony enchanters and astrologers can't help you when God of heaven is speaking because they're phonies. Because God is speaking a foreign language to the false religious leaders. They don't understand this. Do you speak Russian? Unless you speak Russian, you're not going to get it, huh? <clears throat> they don't speak uh, God's talk. So they say, we don't know what that says. <laughs> These phonies could not answer the king. So it says, he became even more terrified. His face grew pale. It says that the queen mother reminded Mr. Big Shot that there was another fellow in the kingdom. I don't know if you heard him or not. But uh, the spirit of the holy gods is in him. 
You may want to call that fella because when your daddy uh, or, your, uh, or, your, or your predecessor was here, the same Daniel interpret his dream uh, for Mr. Big Bad and never take needs it. Uh, you, you knew about that, right? Mm -hmm. But you still want to disrespect him. Okay, then. It ain't like he didn't know, though. See, this is the part people don't understand. He knew about this. Daniel's going to tell him, too. Daniel shows up, and the king says, Are you, Daniel, one of the exiles my father king brought you from Judah? I have heard that the spirit of the gods, no, the spirit of the God, is on you that you have insight, intelligence, and outstanding wisdom. He said, I'm going to brag on you now. But uh, these wise men and enchanters, these fellow I brought in here, they, they couldn't interpret what was on that wall right there. So can you, can you hook a brother up? Now, I have heard that you are able to give interpretations and to solve difficult problems. <laughs> he said, I, I got a difficult problem here because my difficult problem is a hand Wrote this on the wall over here. <laughs> that's, a real, that's a real difficult problem. And everybody saw this hand writing on the wall. And I'm scared. Uh, I'm scared. <laughs> if you can read this writing and tell me what it means, guess what I'm going to do for you, Daniel? I know, I know you're going to get impressed right now. I'm going to hook you up with some purple. I'm going to give you gold change. Place it around your neck. You'll be made third highest ruler in the kingdom. Daniel, are you impressed? Are you impressed with me, Daniel? Uh, King Beza thinks that Daniel cares about his money and gifts. <laughs> nothing I like more than a man of God or a woman in God. Don't care nothing about you trying to bribe me. Uh-uh. Daniel said, you trying to bribe me, fella? This, this is what Daniel says, too. I, I mean, just think about you talking to the king like that. Daniel says, you may keep your gifts for yourself. And give your rewards to someone else. <laughs> I don't even want your rewards, dude. That's what he's saying. If it means I got to compromise, I don't want your rewards. I fear you, Daniel. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. I'm going to hook you up. Not because you're good. I'm going to hook you up because your destruction is about to come. <laughs> That's why I'm going to hook you up. He says, your majesty. Mm-hmm. The most high God, you know him, right? The most high. Can't get no higher. Not these phony little God. Daniel said the most high God gave you your father, Nebuchadnezzar, sovereignty and greatness. Wait a minute. <clears throat> this is like a, slap, a backhand slap in the face of the king. He says you didn't earn it. The most high gave it to you. Who's in charge? Whose plan is this? I said, Daniel tells Belshazzar that it was God who gave it to Nebuchadnezzar and it was God who gave it to you. All this greatness and glory and splendor, you ain't earned it because the high position he gave him, all the nations and the peoples of every language dreaded and feared him because of who? The Most High. Those kings uh, he, he wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. Wait a minute, Daniel. Are you talking about the sovereign plan of God too? I just want to read it because I want to give you the sovereign. Daniel is telling the king everything happened according to God's plan. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar thought he was in charge until God had to put him out there eating grass like a wild animal or something. He said God was the one who promoted him. Those who he wanted to humble, he humble. But when his heart and Daniel said, when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, pride goes before the fall. He was disposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal. What? Wait a minute here. Wait. Did, did I read that right? God Almighty gave Nebuchadnezzar a mind of an animal. Hmm. <clears throat> that is awfully interesting. <clears throat> so God took Nebuchadnezzar's mind. And he was out here, he was worse than a little kid. He was like an animal. Mm, that don't remind you of anything, does it? Okay, then let's keep going. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like the ox. Wouldn't you like to see one of these world leaders who's been arrogant towards God out here eating grass? <laughs> you can't. You can't, this is God's plan though. He said, I will whip you in the line. 
you 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 can bow now, you can bow. It don't matter how powerful you think you are. He says that he was out here with the grass like the oxen, and his body was drenched with dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the most high God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and sets over them anyone he wishes. Booyah! Blow that thing up, Daniel. What you say, Daniel, again? He says the most high God, most high, is sovereign over all kingdoms. Uh, A-L-L, did you have the definition of that? Because my Bible says A-L-L. Now, last time I checked, it was all-inclusive. <laughs> all. He's over all kingdoms. That's Russia. That's China. That's America. That's France. That's Egypt. It's a, does your Bible say that or not? You get the kind of leaders that you deserve. The Bible says that the Most High God is sovereign. It's according to Daniel now. You take this up with Daniel. According to Daniel that the, the Most High God is sovereign over all kingdoms on the earth. Now you got another kingdom from another place? And he sets over them everyone he wishes. I said you get the leaders you deserve. Now finish though. <clears throat> then Daniel says to Belshazzar, have not you humbled yourself, though you knew all of this? He said, you knew what God did to Nebuchadnezzar. You knew for a fact he had did it. You don't read history? Daniel's going to give me a history lesson. Now, you, he said, do you read history? That's technically what he's saying. Do you read history? Well, I'd like to be a fly on the wall to hear a prophet talk to <laughs> one of these leaders like this right here. He says, uh, you knew all of this, Belshazzar. And yet you did not humble yourself. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. What, what did he do, Daniel? He set himself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from the temple brought to you. He said it was a big mistake. Mm -mm. See, the handwriting on the wall came after you touched what you had no business touching. And you and the nobles and your wives and your concubines drank wine from them. That's a problem right there. That's a problem. You praise the gods of silver and gold, which is no gods at all, by the way. Daniel don't say that, but I'm going to throw that in there. He said, you praise the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron and wood and stone, which cannot see or hear. <laughs> Boy, that Daniel is something else. He's talking to the king like this. <laughs> he said, all your gods are frauds. That's what he's saying. I'm declaring the same thing. All other gods, but the god of the Bible are frauds. I'm Daniel. Hey, come here, Daniel. He wasn't finished, though. Come here, Daniel. Come back. Get back on the witness stand, my brother. He says, but um, you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life. Whoo! Oh, boy, that's a sermon right there. That Daniel's on fire. He says, God holds your hand in his, I mean, your life in his hands right here. He just dangling you over hell right now. He got your life in his Do you understand what I'm saying, King Belshazzar? I said, God Almighty holds your life in his hand. And guess what? Every leader in the world, God holds them in his hand. Anytime he wants to take them out, it's a done deal. You hear what I'm saying? God is in charge. Then Daniel says, therefore, he sent this hand to write the inscription. You want the interpretation of it? Do you want the Then you say I had to preach to you and humble you a little bit, knock you off your high horse before I get to interpret it. Notice Daniel could have just came in and interpreted that thing. He said, no, no. We got we to preach now. He said, I'm going to preach to you now. Because you called me in here because these phonies couldn't tell you nothing. Because they had, you had itching ears and they've been pumping you up. You keep pumping these phony leaders up if you want to. He said, you done, they've been pumping you up and now they can't. Now you're going to send for me. Because I'm serving the true only God. So now I'm going to get to the inscription because I done gave you a tongue lashing. Now it says, Mina, Mina, Tico, Parsonin. The words and the meanings of this, Mina, M-E-N-E. -E. You know what that means? God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. What? That's the first word says all that? <laughs> Can you imagine this? M-E-N-E. -E. That means... God has numbered your days, so expiration date is about to expire. It's about to come to the end. He don't know, but the night is it for him. Then, tickle, T-E-K-E-L. You know what that means, King? 
you have been weighed mm -hmm, on the scales here. And guess what? You kind of light on this end right here. When it comes to serving God in righteousness, true righteousness, you kind of light over here. You're heavy on the pride over here, but you kind of light because he weighed you. He put you on the scales and says, uh-uh, humility. It's light. It, it, it's, it's awfully light over here. It's a floating away when it comes to humility and giving God praises. It's so light, it's floating away. Over here, that, that scale is weighed down on your pride, your arrogance, your debauchery. Over here on this scale, he weighed you, brother. And guess what he found out? You're wanting. But I got one last word for you. P-E-R-E-S. You know what that means? Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the, per the Persians. Guess what happened that night? It was a done deal. Handwriting on the wall. America better see the handwriting on the wall. Britain better see the handwriting on the wall. France better see the handwriting on the wall. Germany, Russia, China. The handwriting's on the wall. In our story, Herod and the leaders of the day, they are suffering from the same thing that King Belshazzar was suffering from. They are suffering from the same thing that uh, your leaders of the day is suffering from. See, the leaders back then, Belshazzar, and the leaders of every country around the world are suffering from the same thing. <clears throat> They're suffering from their arrogance and their pride. They don't understand a holy God of Scripture. In their arrogance, they attempt to overthrow God's plan. It ain't going to never work. I'm, I'm clear on that one. God's plan is working out. You can't get me. I'm not chicken little. You can't get me worked up. So in order for you to get worked up, you got to be saying God's lying. He's not in charge. We just read you plenty of scriptures. God is in charge. Old Testament, New Testament, he's in charge. No matter what kind of plans these devils do. The reason some of these plans is working is because the people of God and they doing what they're supposed to do. Now you got to get a punishment. How many times the children of Israel was punished because they didn't do what they're supposed to do? If my people who are called by my name, he didn't say if the government does it, my people who are called by my name, stop playing with God. Stop playing with church. Stop watering down the gospel message. See, trying to overthrow God's plan, it did not work when Satan was kicked out of heaven. You do know Satan got kicked out of heaven, right? Why are you going to follow a dude who get kicked out of heaven? I mean, you got to be pretty crazy to get kicked out of heaven. How arrogant is that? You was in heaven and you got kicked out and you want me to follow you. No, thank you. You got to be, I mean, that you talking about arrogance. You got kicked out of heaven. It didn't work in the days of Herod. Herod was Herod the Great. He's not Herod the Great right now, though. And I can assure you that no government can stop the plans of my God. They work for the guy who got booted out of heaven. That, that's who governments work for now. The fellow who got booted out of heaven. Lucifer, Satan, he got kicked out of heaven. That's the guy who they work for. They are working for a defeated foe who knows he can never win. The devil knows he's not going to win. Yet he is so evil that he simply wants to drag as many sinners as possible to hell with him, along with his demons. Now, it's bad enough Satan got kicked out of he bribed some of these other angels to come with him. Like, you are, you do got it going on, Lucifer, son of the morning star. You may be smarter than God. How'd that work out for you, demons? See, there was angels. Satan was once called the angel of light. Look where he at now. He's darkness. God's plans can never be stopped. No matter how black someone's heart is, no matter how much money, power, or education they have, the very gates of hell will never prevail against the kingdom of God.